Welcome everyone and uh, thanks for joining another one of our Red Cloud webinars. I'm Sebastian DeClute, Senior Vice President of Marketing here at Red Cloud Financial Services. And we have the pleasure today of uh, having Midex Resources uh, on the call with us. We were able to be joined today by David Jamison, who's the President and CEO of Midex, Scott Young, VP Corporate Deve Development, and Tammy Lettinen, who's the VP of ESG. And I really like to thank you all for joining today as we go over uh, one of the, the new up and coming lithium stories with uh, a massive land package in one of the most prolific Northern Ontario lithium belts. So with that, maybe I'll pass it over to you, uh, uh, Dave, if you want to go through a little bit of the, the who, what, where, when, and why uh, on the Midex story. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Seb. Um, yeah, let's, uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Uh, this is a really exciting story. Probably, um, you know, uh, not too many people may have, uh, may have heard about us. We're a private company. Uh, we've got a very small market cap, but we've done some great things in the last uh, 18 months. So I'm glad everybody's here to, to have a listen. Uh, we're Midex Resources. We're in uh, what would, uh, what would, I don't think anybody would argue, is Ontario's largest known lithium belt. Uh, we're in north of uh, Red Lake, about 200 kilometers. I'll just go through the disclaimer there. This is forward-looking statements. So everybody knows. Um, yeah, favorably Greenstone Belt. Uh, we're probably, um, uh, we're not far from the Manitoba border, um, 200 kilometers north of Red Lake. Uh, and um, we've got one of the largest land packages um, for lithium in Ontario. So I think everyone's seen various slides talking about, um, you know, the the gap that's that's coming in lithium production. So I think this is one of the simplest and easy to, to understand. You can see once we get out past, um, you know, out past 2030, the gap between what's expected to come online and what's needed for the electrification that's coming uh, starts to widen rapidly. Um, so note that the blue is actually taking into consideration that over 40 new projects will come on stream during that during that time. So despite that, we're going to we still have a very large gap in production. So this gives you an idea of where we're located. Uh, we're uh, Northwestern Ontario dominant company. We have a number of projects. Um, our flagship uh, that we're going to talk about mostly today is the uh, Barrens River area. Uh, we're located um, directly adjacent to Frontier Lithium uh, Pack Project. Uh, you can see Red Lake. Um, we have a few other projects, uh, lithium projects. Allison Lake is here. Um, uh, Onion Lake is down here, close to Thunder Bay. And then we have our one of our uh, gold projects uh, at Sturgeon Lake. We also have a lithium project in Northeastern Ontario. It's the Case Lake. Uh, East project, and it ties on to Power Metals uh, Case Lake project. Another another graphic that shows you exactly where favorable Lake Greenstone Belt sitting, uh, close to the Manitoba border, as we said. So we're going to talk a little bit about infrastructure. Uh, this area is winter road access for the time being. Um, we're right in the middle of a, of a major power line, power line project uh, that's called Wate. It's being run by Fortis and a joint venture with um, uh, 24 First Nation communities and the Ontario government. So that's underway. Um, it's about halfway through. We've got, the, we've got the cut lines that go right through the middle of our property and they've started standing up the towers. We've also got road construction that's coming up from Red Lake. So the Nungesser comes north of Red Lake. This will extend that road, that existing all weather road right up to the first, the, uh, the first First Nation community of Pekanjikum. Um, so this is a bridge. Th these are, these are uh, pictures from Stantec. Uh, this is a bridge that'll be going in. The materials are there, it's, it's been engineered. So that's, um, that's gonna be started very soon, should be completed by the end of 2023. So yeah, we have a road system. Um, as, as I said, it's winter road access, but there's been engineering to put in the all weather road. 
And you can see there's there's the uh, part of the nun guesser. And this is the transmission project, the transmission line project. So we've got uh, down here at the bottom Red Lake. So the blue is nun guesser and then the red and the yellow are marking uh, various construction um, uh, milestones on the power line. So you can see the favorable Lake Greenstone belt, the lithium belt sitting up here. Um, so as you can see the road, the power line goes right through the middle of that project area. This is what it looks like from the air. If you fly up there, you'll see the winter road. You'll see the, um, the, the clear cuts, the power line. Here's some of the big camps that are there. Ballard Construction is working on that. Um, so it's an 1800 kilometer transmission line uh, in two branches that's going to that's going to electrify 17 First Nation communities. There's hydroelectric potential up there as well. This is a picture of the old uh, power plant that ran the Barrens River mine. And that's also one of our assets. It's a gold silver asset right beside our lithium asset. So this gives you a bit of an idea of what it looks like up there. This is from Frontier Lithium, um, their PAC project. So you can see their three main uh, lithium uh, pegmatite deposits, the PAC where they started out about 20 years ago. Uh, and then Spark, where they're doing most of the, most of their diamond drilling right now. Um, they've done about 11,500 meters this year, two drills. So they're converting their resources up to um, reserves. Uh, they've got these are these are extremely large deposits. So the Spark deposit, um, you've got widths uh, of over 100 meters, and you've got drill holes uh, over, well over 300 meters, averaging. Uh, almost 1.7 lithium. So the grade is fantastic. The widths are phenomenal. Um, we also, they also have done some metallurgical work. Uh, it's showing a very high quality spodumene concentrate, very low in iron, which is critical when you're producing battery grade uh, chemicals. So these are world-class deposits sitting in the favorably greenstone belt. Um, and you, we're gonna we're gonna go into the the greenstone belt a little in a little bit more detail later on. We want to talk about why why these deposits are here, why they're so um, so large and so high grade. This kind of uh, in a little bit diff different graphical form. You have the resource size on the lower axis, grade on the on the left uh, axis. So you can see pre-drilling, I think this is about two years old, this pack and spark would sit here. Uh, with additional drilling, they moved it to the right. Uh, up and to the right means you're, you're top of the class. You've got the best deposit around, highest grade and biggest. You can, a lot of these deposits are in Quebec. You've got the Piedmont stuff in Carolina, uh, and you've got a, the Georgia Lake deposit, Rock Tech, that's sitting in, uh, uh, it's just north and east of Thunder Bay. So there's a, there's a number of projects over that way. I think Rock Tech just had an announcement uh, today about um, uh, going into production. So um, yeah, all of these projects are getting a lot of activity right now, but you can see the Frontier project at Favorable Lake is head and shoulders. So this is our this is our project here. We've we've um, we've recently done some staking. We've bumped this up, went from thirty thousand. We're pushing fifty thousand hectares. You can see where the winter road trace comes up here. This is this is white. It's white line. Um, this is a con big contiguous package. But on the right hand side of road is essentially our Barrens Gold and Silver project. Uh, we picked that up in 2020. We also were able to purchase the historic producing gold mine. So we pretty well got the entire belt for gold, copper, uh, silver, and molybdenum. Um, on the left side of the uh, of the road is essentially our Barron's lithium project. So we were able to pick up more ground in the belt and, ex and extend the same structure that Frontier Lithium is sitting on. We picked up most of the ground that was available. You can see it a little better here, a little bit graphically. Uh, the important thing is this regional crustal structure. It's called the Bearhead Lake Fault. Um, it's very well known uh, in, in, by the government and academic circles as a, it's a major feature. Uh, we have two uh, geological, geological sub-provinces uh, that butt up against each other across the fault. So this thing is deep. 
Uh, it would compare probably with the duster porcupine or the Cadillac larder brakes uh, in Ontario. It's um, um, it's a, it's a phenomenal um, uh, geological feature. You can also see in orange, you can see some of the granites that are really key to, the, to generating the pegmatites. So it's relatively uh, straightforward to follow the geology in this area. So we have a property map that shows some of the other uh, groups that have come in, but it also really keys on, on the importance of our land package. So you can see the pale green is our original uh, gold silver project and the darker green was our lithium focus project and uh, you have uh, frontier in blue with their deposits that they've um, so far discovered some of the other players here we have green technology metals which is a big player in northwestern ontario uh, and a couple of companies that are probably chinese based and australian based have come in and, and tied on so we had at that point we had probably the largest land package uh, in the favorable lake greenstone belt if you put the two of them together, the gold and the lithium. This was our exploration plan that we put forward. Uh, essentially, you've got some of the, you can see where the gold and copper showings were, excuse me, were frontier. So we were, the idea was pretty, pretty basic, was to uh, extend along the same feature and, and uh, we had some ideas from past uh, government work. The idea was to get in there and, and do some prospecting because really nobody, since the government, government had been in there, there really hadn't been any work done. So we'll get into the, a little bit of, the, um, a little bit of the, the detail of what we did recently. Uh, we got up there uh, toward the end of August and did a, a 10, uh, 12 day prospecting program. So this is one of the pegmatites uh, view from the helicopter. This is one of the pegmatites uh, uh, prospectors for scale uh, that we were able to find, land on and get some grab samples. So here's, it's, this is a little uh, pre and post prospecting. So you remember this map from the previous uh, figures. This is what our land package looked like. Um, we had a, we already knew we had a quite a long trend of possibility, but we hadn't confirmed that there were actual lithium bearing pegmatites along that trend. Uh, so we got in there, realized that we, we had what we were looking for and we followed that up with quite a bit of staking. So you can see the expansion uh, size of the property here, went from 31,000 hectares to 47,005. Get a little bit more detail in the next slides. So here's the here's the uh, lithium pegmatites that we were able to locate um, on the on the property with uh, with our prospecting, and uh, so essentially it's not a surprise, more or less right on trend. Um, so uh, and the other the other aspect of this I think that is important is that. Uh, when you're looking for these pegmatites, there are other elements that are key. So you can use them in your geochemistry. So, so this one, for example, is, is this was our highest uh, beryllium tantalum uh, assay. And this, this one right by the boundary with Frontier. Uh, this is probably alterate. This was not a pegmatite, but it was alteration into the wall rock. Uh, these other ones are all pegmatites. Some of these are more tin, cesium, and tantalum rich. The other thing you can use are pigmatite indicators. So from the government mapping, once we had uh, done our prospecting, we started to examine uh, old maps, uh, old reports a little more carefully. And we generated, a, um, we generated an indicator map. And from that, that guided our staking. So this is, um, this is either pigmatites that have been uh, actually mapped by government workers or it's things like moly or tourmaline or uranium that are pretty good indicators that there are pegmatites there. So these orange dots probably represent uh, pegmatite occurrences that are, that are definitely worth going in and having a look at. That's just labeled up. Uh, I don't know if that's large enough for you to see, but you can see the different kinds of things that we were looking for. Uh, OGS pegmatites, uranium, moly, 
uh, tourmaline, garnet, tungsten, uh, they're all indicators of pegmatites. So yeah, this part is, it's getting gonna get a little geological, uh, but I think it's important to understand if you've got um, uh, deposits that are the size and grade uh, that Frontier is, is uh, finding, uh, and they're, you know, they're beating everything in North America, and they may be starting to rival some of the deposits in Australia. You'd like to know why that is and what it is about the favorable lake belt that's so unique. So this is an old map that I'd probably been staring at for 20 years. Um, I've worked up in the area, um, uh, yeah, probably the last uh, 12 years now. But I, you know, I used to generate projects in Ontario. So you look at all these old maps. Uh, this is, it's hard to see, but there's all kinds of showings, mineral occurrences of all different stripes. So you've got copper, silver, uranium, gold, lithium, moly, zinc. It's kind of a, it's, it, it's a grouping that's very unusual. Like if you look, if you look over um, uh, these government maps, generally you'll find gold belts or base metal belts or maybe other things. But this, this is a mix of all different kinds of commodities. So why is that? So if you look at some of the big regional maps uh, the government has done, you can see the Bearhead Lake Fault, which is our key control on the pegmatites, is sitting down here. And it's separating, like I said, two big uh, geological provinces, the Barrens River subprovince and the Sachigo subprovince. Now this is not unusual. Um, you have these subprovince boundaries. It turns out to be extremely important for lithium. Um, all the deposits known so far in northwestern Ontario sit on these sub-province boundaries. Quite easy to see in the geological map. You can trace it down. You can favorable lake is sitting up here, this cluster up here. You can see some of the, the key areas. There's Red Lake and Muscle White for scale. But you can trace this fault for over 100 kilometers down through the geology. And you can also trace it on the magnetics. So you can see a uh, favorable lake sitting up here in the corner. You can trace the mag feature all the way down through. It actually actually crosses through a second sub province boundary, which is really interesting, uh, and down into the Uchi. Uh, so what's what that's telling us when it's when it's crossing a, a, a boundary like that, it means it's a fault that's likely been active over a, several episodes. So that's, that's a unique characteristic of this fault system. So we zoom back in uh, to Favorable Lake and, and look where the fault sits. It becomes very evident. It's, it's truncating geological units. Um, it, you, know, you can see the obvious uh, separation, uh, the obvious separation of the, sorry, I'll just run it down there. So there's the fault running down through there separating to the two big geological provinces. And then you've got this wedge shape uh, of uh, different commodities. So our uh, Barrens River gold mine is in there. You've got all kinds of molly, uh, copper, uh, some unique uh, copper minerals in here. Um, and then all along this, this fault, you've got uranium, lithium, molly. Um, you've got a lot of tourmaline. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting confluence of commodities. So yeah, Midex essentially, you know, we've we've got a lot of uh, regional, um, we've done a lot of regional work, a lot of compilation, and then we've gone in. Uh, we're very um, very experienced in Ontario, so we know the staking system. We have a vast network with prospectors uh, built up over decades. We know that we know the way the system works. We've dealt with uh, a lot of the First Nations all through the areas. So we put together a number of projects, uh, five of which are, are lithium assets. And uh, you know we've we've been able to move fairly quickly because of our experience in Ontario. And at Favorable Lake, we now have a massive land position. Um, in in probably the best lithium environment that you could have. Um, and we know we know where lithium's going. It's I mean, there's some we have a lot of pundits that weigh in, but there's some very 
Um, uh, you know, there's some very interesting uh, comments. So we have uh, Kurt House. He's the CEO of Cobalt Metals. Um, if you follow that, that's where Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates came together and just decided, you know, they were going to throw a ton of money at, at looking for critical minerals to help the electrification uh, process. Um, so he made a statement. He said uh, the mobile battery business needs on the order of three to four trillion dollars of new lithium discoveries by 2050. So that's just not taking the brine uh, deposits and the known lithium deposits in Australia. These are brand new discoveries that are required. And that's what Midex is. We've put together land packages of high quality areas that are known lithium, um, that are known for their lithium uh, deposits. And uh, we've put them together at a reasonable, a reasonable cost and so that we can add shareholder value. I think we're, yeah, we're extremely well positioned for lithium discoveries. It's, um, you know, the timing is right. Uh, we have the, we have experience in this particular jurisdiction and we have an, a number of different ways we can go at this. So, um, uh, you know, we, you know, if you if you know the frontier story, uh, you know the the modus operandi of those guys. You know, they're it's it's a great story. I know they were at it for a long time before they were able to uh, get the notice that they have now. And even now, I still I still believe they're overlooked. Um, so you know, we 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 talk to those guys about logistics and a number of things. Uh, it's a it's a great group. They want to keep this in in Canada. Um, uh, with, you know, Canadian geologists, Canadian uh, CEOs. The other thing is uh, both groups have a very strong ESG commitment in this area. And, uh, you know, they have, you know, as I said, they've been in the area for quite a while. Uh, I worked up there from 2012 to 2015 on the next Greenstone Belt North. So I know all the communities. And I think that's really important in these areas you, you really need to work on your social license. It's critical to move forward. So this, this is a peer review. We looked at companies dominate, dominantly in Northwestern Ontario. So um, they either have, you know, 90% of their projects in Northwestern Ontario, or they're yeah, completely, um, uh, completely in that area. So uh, Frontier, of course, that's their only project is PAC, uh, Rock Tech is Georgia Lake, uh, International Lithium, uh, they're near Dryden. Green Technology Metals, um, that's an interesting story. They've, they've gotten um, a lot of support from Lithium Americas down in the States. All their projects are in Northwestern Ontario. They're probably the most prolific company for projects in Northwestern Ontario. They have one, they have one project up at Favorable Lake as well. And then Critical Resources also has, all their projects are in, uh, or in Northwestern Ontario. So you look at the market cap, we're the only private group, uh, $6 million market cap. Uh, the comparisons, of course, Frontier with the results they're getting, uh, you know, half billion market cap. Rock Tech uh, up there as well. They're all, also, there's some, uh, uh, some of that is from the converter they're gonna put in Europe. Uh, they've, they've been talking about um, and these other ones, uh, you know, Green Technology uh, raised $55 million earlier this year. They've been extremely aggressive on their projects. Um, so, you know, a justifiable market cap, obviously. Um, so, yeah, you can see we're, we're up and coming. Uh, we've, you know, we've got arguably the largest land package of anyone, any one of these groups. And I'd say it's equally prospective. Um, you know, if you factor in, um, you know, what's been found up there in the past, uh, it, it bodes well for the future. So there's the group. Um, we've got a very strong board and very good management. Um, so myself, I've got um, extensive experience in exploration. Uh, I graduated in 84, right into the bit, <coughs> lots of juniors. Um, you know, mostly Ontario, but Quebec was Sweden, uh, lots of time up in the Arctic, um, looking at projects, you know, developing new projects. Um, you know, sometimes they say the best geologist is the one that's looked at the most rocks, but I think it's also the one that's worked on the most projects and the most varied projects commodity wise, even, you know, going from grassroots right up, 
you know, working underground in mines, it's all it's all critical experience. Uh, Tammy Lettinen is our VP of ESG. She's got a, a ton of experience with junior mining and with First Nation consultation. She's worked on grassroots and advanced projects, permitting, et cetera. Again, ESG just critical in in, uh, in working uh, uh, on these projects that you want to you want to push to development. And there's Scott Young. He's our uh, corporate development, uh, very well connected all over Canada and Europe. Uh, he helps us raise the money. Strong board of directors, uh, Glenn Baldwin. He's from Australia. Uh, a ton of mining experience. Uh, John Cullen has been in the business, uh, the brokerage business for for decades. Uh, he's done mining deals, oil and gas deals. Uh, we got Terry Harbert from Talisker, as well as Andreas Tinjaro from Talisker. Uh, also, you know, a multitude of companies under their belt as well. And Glenn Rochon helped me found the company back in 2019. Uh, he's been in the resource industry for over 40 years. So that's going to wrap it up. Um, I think we want to move on. Said we want to move on to some questions. Yeah, sure. I'll jump in here. Thanks very much for for that run through, uh, uh, Dave. And it's it's nice to see the new deck uh, up here. It's obviously a consistently evolving process when you're going and, and adding as much and moving as quickly as you guys are. So maybe just to, to to touch on this because I think it's a really really important point that I believe sets you guys apart from. Uh, a lot of the rest is that, you know, lithium became hot and and many individuals started going and trying to stake property specifically for lithium. But there's only so few and far between opportunities uh, to go and stake land on on big belts. And you guys were already there. Can you talk about uh, a little bit what the benefit is of you guys already having had that property? Because if you, you ask me, you would have never ended up on having this land package that you have now. Uh, if it wasn't for your experience in the area um, uh, prior to sort of Frontier's big discovery. Yeah, that's that's right. So, I mean, like I said, I was staring at that map for 20 years. I was up in Sandy Lake. I was watching what was going on at the old gold mine and, you know, digging into it a little bit. Um, I met the Frontier guys. I mean, lithium was up and down. It had a good run in 2015 and then back down again. So when we went into the belt, um, yeah, it was gold, silver, uh, copper that we were after. Um, but we were also regional players. So we picked up as much ground as we could, including we tied right onto Frontier. Uh, it's, it was Greenstone Belt. Um, there was a few lithium indicators there, but, you know, we, we just wanted to have um, anything that had potential for uh, gold, silver, copper. And I think that's the first time I called up. Trevor Walker at Frontier and said, Trevor, we just tied on to you. Uh, and he said, no, that's great. I know you guys. Uh, I'm glad to have you aboard. Um, but we went about our business on gold and silver, and but we got to know what Frontier was doing. And then, you know, you research lithium and you, and you just, you know, you get excited, right? And it's like, I, I went to the guys and said, let's keep staking. You know, I mean, the trend is there. It's Most of it's available. Why don't we just keep going? So, yeah, I got the go ahead and you know, we compiled and, and put it together. We did it in a series of, of actions. And um, the biggest one being right after we did our prospecting this summer is we looked at it. Um, we said, there's they're here. I mean, the lithium pegmatites are here. It was a bit of a theory before because the government hadn't really mapped them in as lithium pegmatites. The indicator minerals was moly and uranium and all the right stuff. But so I said, they're there. The trend keeps going. You know, we've added another 68 kilometers to the trend. So we said we can't be going out stumping. You know, we can't be going out talking about this stuff with all with ground left left open. So we grabbed everything we could. Yeah, and I think to that end, I know that uh, that that Scott's having a conversation here with one of uh, one of the the people on the line. But um, the question that had come in, I, I love that guy's name, Seb. It's his Sven Heckel. It's a yeah. great name, <laughs> and that's been. Uh, uh, positive, and that's not always the case in in various parts of the world. So uh, maybe you can touch on that as well. Sure. Well, it's it's a great question, you know, and uh, you get that, and you say, well, you, that's it's got to be so much different. Um, but you know, we we've talked to some people, you know, and and uh, you know, PhDs and people that are really smart on lithium and these these type of deposits. It's exactly the same as gold. You know, you go out, you prospect, you get some numbers, you go back again, you you know, you keep focusing, you keep focusing. It's relatively simple. 
Um, you saw the pictures of the uh, the frontier deposits. They're sitting on more or less on hilltops or on the side of ridges, right? Uh, not to say that there's not some buried uh, deeper, and, and there will be, but prospecting works. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost the exact same procedure that you would use for gold. Gold does not Dave, respond well to geophysics. <laughs> Lithium doesn't Dave, I would I would argue that lithium exploration is easier than gold. And this is sort of, this is a debate that we need to have because from an investment standpoint, you look there and you say, okay, how quickly can we define a resource? And so one of the great things about lithium that I've learned over the past couple of years is that a lot of it sits on surface and you can see it. Whereas gold exploration yeah you start with surface samples and then you got to drill but it seems to me that you see a pegmatite like first and you can use a helicopter for example and the neat thing about how they found the, the spark deposit at, at frontier is the fact that they saw it from a helicopter and it was a burn so there was a, a an old forest fire that took all the surface stuff off there's white rock there. They go, they sample it. Oh my God! Look at the look at the um, look at the amount of of uh, minerals we have here, and then away we go. Yeah, I mean that that's that is uh, that's very true. I mean it is. It so does, you need my I, point is you need less money to explore. Well, you know what I would theory. say. You know, gold could be the same. Let's just 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 imagine that nobody had really realized that Kirkland Lake was there right and they just you know it was way you know somebody flew with a helicopter and started sampling and they're like holy cow look at all this gold well that's what it would have been like but you can't you can't stake a claim in Kirkland Lake anymore like you can't get a property there so we're kind of at that so lithium is so new that we're kind of almost in those old prospector days right like all these belts where you to get to Timmins it would take you 10 days right by canoe from the nearest end of rail well, you know, we're not that, you know, we've got technology now and a winter road and everything else and we're going to have access, but it's untouched on, you know, we went in there, nobody laid a hand. Investors and potential investors, which is we're sitting right beside a, a company that has defined one of the best deposits in North America. They're going into production. Uh, the government, the Canadian government's behind them. The provincial government is behind them. They just did a bot deal for $20 million. Um, and so one of the things that I like to explain to people when they're, they're potential investors in Midex is you have a company that's got a half billion dollar market cap sitting right beside us and we're raising money at a six million dollar market cap and we're on the same trend so the the potential is is massive and and the fact that the market is going to be buoyant for at least 10 to 20 years in this commodity uh to me is it, it's the most exciting bit of mining um in the world because we know that gold is difficult right now we know base metals are difficult and they go through their cyclical events but this is an energy metal that is going to be required for at least 10 to 15 20 years yeah i'd like to i'd like to say i'm wearing my green jacket for a reason it's not because i won the masters <laughs> but <laughs> at the end of the day i mean uh if you do look at the maps that you guys have obviously um and you look at uh, sort of the, the the part of the land package that that Frontier has versus the amount of uh, the trend that you guys have, it is quite obvious that you guys you know have have probably some of the most prospective land in the area. Again, to my to my previous point, and that being said, I mean Frontier right now they're putting out a lot of more monster holes, uh, some some really really spectacular stuff, and a lot of that's infill because they're not out there going and they found their their world class deposit right. They found their giant and. Um, and they're going about it uh, in that sense. So the, those companies need companies like Midex to go and jump around and 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 find um, you know the next deposit in the area. And I think we're really uh, at the precipice of that. Um, that and the fact that that lithium 
discoveries, like you said, can still be found at surface. But I did want to go in and, and bring Tammy onto the line here. And uh, Tammy's had some some significant experience working with first the land because we can all go wa uh, wave our arms. But there's a there's a specific reason why we have you on the call here to say what the, the, the lay of the land is up in northern Ontario. And, and what are you hearing uh, from the government up there? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing some unprecedented investments by both the provincial and federal government in terms of infrastructure. Obviously, going from from 31 to almost 50,000 hectares of land, um, that really shows that you're, you're sort of first boots in the, on the ground to exercise and, and, and the helicopters that you've flown over areas that were suspected to be copper, um, potentially uh, uh, gold bearing, as we know, um, allowed you to go and, and really add to this package more so than you may have if you had named yourself Mydex Lithium and people would go and say, hey, we're going to go and put, uh, go do, try to do all our staking uh, around Mydex. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're, we're science driven. Um, uh, like I said, we've got uh, loads of experience, uh, grassroots right up to, you know, mining projects. So um, you like to, um, you know, you like to make your decisions based on on science and data. So that's uh, that's why I don't know if you look at our property uh, claim thing. It's got a million dates on it because we, you know, we would look at it. Okay, this this makes sense. This makes sense. This makes sense. Um, then the biggest trigger of for us was, man, we got we got lithium pegmatites. You know, the trend absolutely keeps going. So um you know we've got to we've got to tie up this ground and and you know you just get excited just like look at all this ground that we that we can cover uh we want to use prospect prospecting but we want to use some some maybe some innovative techniques like biogeochem uh that really look at it regionally radiometrics other things like that um yeah i mean it's um uh, yeah it it really is unprecedented the opportunity here um you know, going back to Scott's point and Tammy, the the, the, the government support. I mean, we just had we just had the um, the Inflation Reduction Act. Just mail checks out to lithium mining companies. Just mail them a check. Uh, I've never seen that. I've never I've never seen the su the support. Like even the federal government, even the Liberals, uh, supporting uh, the mi mining like that. I mean, it's we've got tailwinds. Uh, that are, are yeah, it's un totally unprecedented for uh, critical minerals, but especially lithium. And Dave, um, I, I, we have some questions coming in here on the line from, uh, and obviously, uh, um, words getting around about Mydex because one of the individuals that's on the line here is probably one of my favorite people on the street. But uh, I'm not going to say his name here. But million bucks or probably more. So I'd be talking like a regional geochem, uh, regional radiometrics, lidar, prospecting. Um, you know, that's the, you know, the full Monty right on, on that part. And then you, you know, you, you keep working it down and you, you generate 10 to 20 uh, drill targets. Um, we already know where we have some lithium pegmatites. You could start there. So you could go right to those spots and start channel cutting and get a drill going, you know, for probably, you know, less than a million bucks. But I don't know if that's the right approach. To, that's for, from an explorationist. You always start big and you whittle it down and you drill your very best targets. Um, but sometimes the market says, look, you know, you've, you've got something good. I mean, Frontier, they had, the, they had, like you said, they had their deposit. Let's go. Let's drill it off. Um, so that's another point. They, they haven't, you know, they haven't done a ton of exploration, regional exploration um, on their, on their package. But at heart, we're, we're regional guys. We're, you know, we're explorationists. We want to find... Uh, you know, we want to find multiple discoveries, you know, and uh, narrow and it down. we want to be aggressive, Dave. We want to be aggressive. I know. This is well. the discussion we have. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically, Scott has the helicopter as a, as a drill under a helicopter, and he's waiting for me to point where to put it. That's essentially how he looks Scott, at it. Scott's, Scott's representing the investors, and you're representing the geologists. Well, I represent both, <laughs> but I know what's good for the investors, so I'm trying to tell them. But anyway, I know everybody's in a hurry, right? But, you know, it comes out in somewhere in between. That's what you end up doing, right? It's sort of a modified uh, 
uh, if you let the geo do everything, it takes too long. But if you let the, you know, the, the IR guys do it, it's, you know, you might make a boo-boo. So for sure, no, you, fair, might fair get it. you might, you might get that huge deposit that you're <laughs> yeah. looking for. And we believe in it. We yeah. believe in it, Dave. Yeah. Well, absolutely. It's, it's the, the age old say, saying, if you see a geologist heart re- rate go up by, uh, by one beat per minute, you should be an investor, right? So, yeah, yeah. well, uh, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, you know, Scott's swinging for the fences, you know, I'm going for the batting average. I like to keep my batting average around 500. Scott, he just hits a home run every 50 years or so. <laughs> well, that's fine. And that's good. I mean, you can be, you know, I want to be. Left. I want to be Aaron Judge hitting 62 homers with a 311 batting average. I mean, that would be great, but we can't all be Aaron Judge, right? So, well, if you were Aaron Judge, you wouldn't be in uh, in the World Series anymore, right? So, yeah, yeah, I want to <laughs> uh, talk to him. Yeah, um, maybe I'll. Uh, do you think that you're going to need in order to go and continue uh, moving forward uh, in the short term? Well, we're yeah, we're in the middle of a raise. Um, yeah, we're going to need. Uh, I think the issue with us being private is the flow through, you know, we can, we can qual we do qualify for critical flow through that extra um, government incentive. Um, but most investors would like uh, you to be public when they do the flow um, for obvious reasons. So, you know, we're pushing to, um, to get our listing. I think that's, that's critical for us to uh, spend the expiration dollars that we need to spend. Um, uh, as a private company, you know, we've raised a fair bit of hard dollars and that's, you know, we've spent hard dollars on expiration. I don't have a problem with that, but, um, you gotta, I mean, if we're going to go at this the right way, we have to, um, like I said, you know, at least a million and probably, um, you know, significant budgets need, need to go into this uh, belt. And there's a, there's some sense, sense of urgency as well. Like this is a little bit of a race, um, whoever gets, the deposits and and control they may ultimately control the, the refineries right the conversion plants frontier is talking about one in thunder bay rock tech's putting one in europe um green technologies wants to put one in thunder bay so who builds the snow lake in manitoba who builds the converter it's just like the smelter when you control the smelter you control the mining company so there's a sense of urgency to get at this right and get it done and become if we can if we can help uh, make the favorable lake lithium belt like the biggest in the world or biggest yeah at least let's start in north america but you know that that gives us that gives us a little bit of a bit a little bit of leeway right down the road when you start when you start shipping your start shipping your minerals fair enough yeah, and to get, to, to, sorry sorry so just to get just to fill out what dave is saying that you know it, it really is our goal to be public as soon as possible we're uh, we're going down the road regardless of uh, of the direction you choose we are yeah i think we're probably going to do an rto uh, we've identified a couple of different parties that uh, we know very very well that uh, have huge access to capital, which is really important to us because, uh, you know, one of the things, especially in a market like this, we recognize that, you know, you have your own Rolodex and if you have a larger team, you have a bigger net. And so the folks that we're talking to that we're down the road with are very good at what they do. They have lithium people involved and uh, that's that's important to us going down the road. So um we're we're quite excited about this and i think it's it's going to add huge value to the existing shareholders and it's going to help us have more access to capital uh i have another question here on the line um i'm just going to read it out uh we've been evaluating approximately 40 lithium companies in the space uh at the early stage what is the cost of you to hold such a large land package yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, in Ontario, uh, you have two years, um, and then you need to uh, apply uh, assessment work uh, to continue holding the ground. And it, it doesn't go up over time; it stays. It's it's four hundred dollars a unit uh, a cell. Um, so yeah, we have. Um, well, if you took our entire all our projects, uh, yeah, it's over a million bucks um a year that we we need to apply now there's some caveats to that uh we're 
the gold projects. Uh, we're in the process of a farm out. Uh, can't read, I'm not going to say any more. Um, so that'll help on that front. Um, the other thing is we're, we're permitting our gold project. And it's uh, right now the government's given us a break on, on, on that uh, because it's, uh, there's some, you know, the government has to come in and do a rehab job so that, and they just got that going. So they're giving us a break on that. So it isn't too bad right now. If you look at our, our due dates, a lot of them are out in 2024. Um, and, um, you know, we've done some work, uh, we've done, we've done some airborne LIDAR that we just did the prospecting program. Um, once we get up and running and get our, a drill program going, then that's, that's where you really, you know, you can get way ahead of the curve. Bought the mine. So we own it outright. There's an underlying uh, royalty on the mine, uh, just, just around the mine itself. And then we've, we have done some deals on the gold silver that, that, uh, um, but they're not on our key, I wouldn't say key claims, but they filled in the package. There's some royalties there, but, but you know, probably 85% of the, of the package, um, there's no royalties on it whatsoever. And what percentage of your capital will you be putting towards lithium uh, versus uh, the, the gold assets that you have? All of it. All of it towards lithium. Okay, the, so that's that's a key a, a key point uh, to be made as well. That uh, you know this is a lithium focused uh, uh, company, and uh, and they'll be moving forward uh, uh, to that end. Um, any more questions uh, from the line? Uh, when when are you when your next when is your team going to be boots on the ground next? Actually, we're trying to get up there in a in about a week. Um, now we're getting close to the yeah, getting uh, it's the end of the season. Essentially, we we had to you know we had a window before hunting season, so that's uh, hunting's critical uh, uh, for first uh, first nations and well all over Ontario. I mean, you got to be careful in the bush this time of year. But uh, yeah, they really didn't want us flying around with a helicopter um, during the middle of their hunt, so. Once things get a little colder, we can go back, but then, you know, you're tight for snow. So we're, we're going to do our best to get back up there and get, get another three or four days in uh, prospecting. Um, and then I think this winter we're going to, we're seriously considering BioGeochem, which uses the, uh, the extensive tree cover as a geochemical tool. Um, winter's a great time to get around up there. The access is by snowmobile um, and we can stay in the community or Valard camp. So Logistics is pretty straightforward. The big program is going to be next summer. Uh, we're going to put as many crews as we can out on the ground. Um, we're going to, you know, it's prospecting, detailed channel cutting, uh, stripping out crop, um, detailed geochem. So, and then hopefully we're going to generate a number of really high grade uh, drill targets by the end of the by the end of the summer. That's great. And then uh, I get another question coming through here. Um, so uh, it's my understanding that you have uh, recently conducted a field program, uh, obvious by your current and updated maps. Um, can you tell me what you're most excited about from that field program and, and, and how you're going to uh, utilize that data moving forward? Yeah, well, yeah, it was like day one, the, you know, the guys flew around. Um, it's the size of the pegmatites up there, um, and we haven't even quantified it. I don't really... You know, I've gotten field notes, but I'd like to confirm. <laughs> it's not a teaser, but crabs, we've got a number that are uh, highly anomalous in lithium. We're up to point, I guess, 0. 0.13 was our best. Um, yeah, we didn't do a ton of scout. We, we, you know, we landed, they walked around, they didn't strip too much. Um, you know, wherever they could get a sample, these things are kind of flat, right? You'd have to find something you could get a so, you know, really just r not random, but, you know, you, you couldn't really stick around long. So I not think high for, grading is what you're saying. No, and it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's how do you high grade a lithium? Like yeah, exactly. right? I mean, it's not it's not easy to do. You got to you really got to systematically sample it to know what you have. And that takes time. So we had a tight window. We just wanted to cover the, you know, cover it. Our goal was like, do we have pegmatites? How big are they? And is there any lithium in them? And check, check, check. Um, as evidenced by our excitement to go out and stake more ground. So, yeah, that's that's the biggest thing, the size of them, because that, that makes all the difference in the world. 
And for a number of reasons, like if you talk to Frontier, they're going to be able to go much, much deeper on their open pits, right? When you have a wide deposit, like it's almost like a porphyry size, porphyry copper, you can make huge, you can go down three, four times deeper than these other groups. They'll have to go underground. And Frontier is going to have, they're going to still be open pitting, which is much cheaper. So the economics of these big pegmatites is phenomenal. Well, that's great and all great news. And, and uh, you know, may I hope you, go, I wish you guys the best of success. Uh, and may you have more samples with an anomalous lithium results than I have hair on my head. So. <laughs> We're in good shape then, Seth. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, thanks very much, guys. Um, I, I urge anybody that has any further questions to reach out to the Red Cloud representative. We're always available. Um, you know, and we uh, we we do these uh, these kinds of things, these webinars from time to time, typically around one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Eastern Standard Time. But uh, keep an eye out for Mydex News, and should you want to join the mailing list, please again reach out to your Red Cloud rep or sign up uh, on their website. Thank you very much, Scott, Tammy, and David for the great update, and uh, we look forward to hosting you at our Red Cloud conference coming up at the Sheridan Hotel, November 9th and 10th. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, please feel free to do so as well. And you can do so at redcloudfs.com.